And we're live. Welcome back to another Corona Geek. Here where we talk all about mobile app development using Corona SDK. Host Charles McKeever. And today we're going to talk about texture memory management. We're going to look at some uh, configuration file settings. And we're also going to talk about uh, creating a counter for your app that flips through, uh, you know, kind of zooms through and, and, and increments the score uh, in a cre creative way. So uh, I think we got a bunch of other stuff to talk about, but I can't remember what all it is right now. Let's just get into, uh, let's just get into some things here. So joining us, we've got uh, Dr. Brian Burton, who is on mute. Uh, we've got Ed Marina joining us. Hey, Ed. Uh, hey. Thanks, Rick, for joining us today. And Sergey's here. Hey, here, Sergey. Uh -oh. Sergey Lurk from Russia. Thanks for joining, joining us, man. Appreciate it. So, uh, if you guys didn't get a chance to watch uh, Corona Geek 110, you guys got to go check that out. We had uh, Chris Byerly on the show, and he talked about Coronium Game Server 1.0 and demoed some code there and provided a whole developer kit for us to mess with. So, uh, that's all discussed in 110. We also talked about Windows Phone apps, and uh, they're starting to show up in the Windows uh, App Store. Uh, and so if you are interested in that sort of thing, send us uh, send us an email. Send me an email here at uh, coronageek uh, at coronalabs.com and we'll see, get you, try to get you hooked up. Also, we talked about swiping objects to specific points on the screen. Um, and that was an interesting conversation because Sergey had some thoughts about that as well. He's done that in some of his, uh, some of his apps. Um, but that was all in 110, so go check that out. We'll put a link in the show notes. Also, if you haven't been over to Corona University in a while, you should definitely go check that out. We've got 100-plus videos, and uh, we're actually working on uh, the next 100 now. Uh, we've got uh, videos on you know widgets and physics API and sample apps and the whole bit, so go check those out. Also, if you're a, a customer of burtonsmediagroup.com, if you've ever purchased one of Dr. Burton's uh, Corona books, you need to know that there is a update... Uh, so, so that uh, there was a small fix to a problem that was left over from Graphics 1.0 to, to Graphics 2.0 transition, and it primarily impacted Chapters 2 and 8. So if you are a customer of his, you probably will be receiving an email soon letting you know where you can download the, the update. And if you haven't checked out burtonsmediagroup.com, go check that out. Dr. Burton's got a, a bunch of books over there on Corona, and he's really good about updating them and making sure that you get those when those updates occur. So go check that out. Also, another piece of news here. G uh, Game Center is now, a, in iOS, it's now a plugin. So basically, uh, as of build 2455, it's been moved to a plugin, and what that means to use is that if you need to include, uh, you know, if you want to use it, you need to include it into your build.settings. Uh, and there is a uh, some more information over on the Corona Labs website, and we'll put a sh link in the show notes. I, li I like uh, how everything's moving into plugins. Every, you know, more of the core things that you know, or the things that used to be more in the core are be, are be moved out to plugins. Yeah, it's, it's a good idea. I think so. Uh, yeah, it, uh, helps lighten the uh, end binary size. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's just like the, we were just talking about right there. I mean, if you don't use Game Center, then why have it included, right? I mean, it's, it's totally up to you. Uh, and and as a reminder to everybody who is, is following along here, if you haven't uh, posted your 2048 hex high score to the Corona Geek Facebook wall, now is your chance to do it. Go out there and uh, share your score with us. We're going to give away a $50 gift card on November 3rd. Uh, when we'll pick the winner, and then we'll also pick a new game to play. So we'll put a link in the show notes, show notes to the app that you can download, uh, either in, on the Apple App Store or on Google Play. Um, but if you have a high score, I think right now somewhere we're somewhere in the 20s. I think uh, Karim posted his last. I don't remember what his score was, but I posted mine. I was only like 15,000 or something like that. And Sergey, I know that. I know you said there's higher scores than that, like 23, 25, or something. Don't ask. Don't ask. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Sergey's not. Uh, he's not posting anything. It's his game, but he's not posting anything because I know he would. He would wipe <laughs> us. Yeah, yeah, exactly. He would wipe. The winner, you know, there are people who play a lot better than me, and I have no, absolutely no idea how they manage to do this. 
That's yeah. awesome. Yeah, if you guys are interested while you're listening to the show, go over to spiralcodestudio.com. You can check out all of Sergey's work over there. Uh, but we will put a link in the show notes. All right. One other thing that I wanted to share with you guys, or well, one of two other things I want to share is that there's a there's a new swipe parental gate available over on Code Canyon. I don't know if you we, a few shows back we had uh, a segment on creating a parental gate for your children's apps, and one of the developers in the community has published a a swipe parental gate. So basically, you use gestures to pass or unlock the parental gate. You can swipe with two fingers in four directions, up, down, left, and right. And uh, if you are using Corona build 2393 uh, or later, it supports uh, the free, the starter, the pro, and the enterprise edition licenses. So you pretty much got everybody covered. And it also has French and English uh, language support. So you can find it on Code Canyon. There's, it's at $10, uh, and we will put a link in the show notes. So, so thank you for that. And also, here's one uh, here's one last thing that you need to know about, especially because it expires October 31st, and that is that AT&T is doubling their data plans. Have you guys seen this? No. <laughs> Was it? No, why, I haven't seen it. Why, why are you laughing at? Because I don't even have a phone, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, forget, I forget that. <laughs> Call me a Luddite. It's all right. Yeah, it's all right. Well, so AT&T is basically, it says that, the, according to the article, it says they're doubling their plans. What they're doing is is their, you know, their 10 gig plan is becoming their 20, and their 20 is becoming their, I think it was like their, th their 15 is becoming their 30, and their 20 is becoming their 40. And, and so uh, what that really means is that for the same price, they're doubling the, the data. So if you're an, an existing AT&T customer, though, you have to actually co contact them in order to, to make the upgrade. So what I did was I was, I needed to be in one of the stores for something else, and while I was there, I had the guy upgrade me. So I, I had the 10 gig plan for a hundred dollars, uh, and then what I did was I just upgraded to the 15 gig, which which was um, like another twenty dollars or whatever, and um, so then I got the I wound up with a 30 gig plan. Is that monthly? Yeah, yeah. So the so the the base plan is like hundred and thirty dollars. Yeah, don't even get me started, Dad. There's it's it's it's, in, it's insane. I mean, I, I love my phone. That's all I have to say. I mean, okay. I mean, yeah, because it's we'll just leave it right there. Yeah, because we're you know we're talking uh, depending on and some people I would be interested to know their 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 take on this, but you know, cell phone plans these days are you can't get less than sixty bucks, you know, and that's that's just one person never oh, using, no, never. Yeah. Never, yeah, that's one one person never using their phone. So, yeah. but uh, you know, a two hundred dollar cell phone plan is not uncommon. Cool. So, uh, but anyway, I will put a link in the show notes, and if if you're interested in that sort of thing, go check it out. It, it does expire October thirty first. It's a promotional thing, so if you don't take advantage of it, then I guess you'll just continue to stay where you are. And one one other note is that once you once you get this promotional uh, plan, uh, if you change it later. Then you, you lose it. So, oh, well, I'm sure there'll be a reason why you'll want to change later, but you know, it's kind of like get it and just get it and keep it for a while. Get it and stick with it. Yeah, yeah. And hopefully, we'll, at some point, I want to circle back around with Brian uh, because I know that uh, we, we wanted to have the uh, discussion on plans, on upgrade plans, and stuff like that. You know, because uh, the carriers are, are making a bunch of changes in the way that they handle things, and it's just. It's making it crazy for everybody. Yeah, it's kind of chaos lately. Y yeah, I think so. I mean, just just like uh, you you have to be you know you have to be real careful about reading the fine print and understanding what that means. And it, and and it seems like everybody I talk to has a different situation. So mm -hmm. I well, watch. Uh, uh, yeah. Oh, go, on. No, go ahead. I was going to say I um, this made me think about it. Is I watch uh, App Annie. I you know I look at the App Annie site every day sort of to see what's floating up to the top and is popular. And I don't know if you guys do, but I've noticed over the last couple of weeks since iOS 8 came out and, you know, the iPhone 6 and all that, that there has been nothing new. Everything that was popular was around. It's like there's this huge backlog of new content that just hasn't shown up yet. Mm, I, would, I, I, yeah, I would imagine there's all these uh, iOS 8 updates that people are having to approve, right? Yeah. I think that there's. I think we're going to see an avalanche of new apps suddenly just show up for uh, iPhone. Mm. 
That makes sense. Well, you, and, you know, I, I can imagine on the iPhone side of things, you know, now that people can, now there's more real estate and, and new features in the SDK, I'm sure there's going to be a bunch of things that we've never seen before. Yeah. I think a lot of people had trouble getting through the uh, acceptance process, you know. Yeah. I, I tell you, this isn't what we were going to talk about today, but but I would say that I, I would like to see the app store, uh, the Apple App Store review process, um, re redesigned. Not explained. I mean, I think we all have it, right? You submit your stuff, and then you just wait, and then, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and then you either get approved or you don't. I mean, that's, that's part that part of the process. That part's pretty simple. But let's just say, for example, like, um, you know, if you're if if you have a, a track record of you know a good track record, you should be able to submit um, changes to your app and and not have to go through a particular review process. You know, let, let's let's just say you know you've uh, you've submitted your app, you've gotten a certain number of reviews or a certain number of downloads or, or you know or you've you know there just should be a point where like that okay you're good to go you know and then until you do something um, to to change that. You're you're you can you get a free pass, right? I mean, they do that on YouTube. Like when you know, as long as your account is in good standing, then you get to you can do advertising or you can do you know special features. But uh, but if you jeopardize that in some way with your activ activities, then you, you know you can have that taken away from you. So you know what I'd like to see someday is actual numbers on how many people submit apps every day for review at Apple. And just like a month or two of numbers that show, well, out of that month, we got this many submissions, and this many didn't make it, and this is how long it took on average. Yeah. Because it's such a black box; it's a mystery. Right. Yeah. Well, and and there's got to be a there's got to be a balance between what Google Play is doing right now and what Apple is doing. Yeah, Google Play, which is you know one hour later, it's up on the store. <laughs> right. Super simple. Uh, which is great if you are. Um, a rule follower, mm -hmm. or great if you're not a rule follower. <laughs> you know I mean? well, west over there. They're right. It's a little, little too loose. Uh, yeah. But there's got to be a happy medium. I mean, you got to be able to, like I say, if you if you go through an initial review process and you pass that screening, and you get some sort of status as a trusted um, entity, then you should be able to, you know, you should go to into, into a different queue or something. All I'm all I'm saying. Lanes. Something, anything, yeah. Especially if it's a, uh, yeah. Especially if it's a an existing app. So I don't know. I, I'm sure there'll be people who would figure out how to manipulate that. Oh, I'm sure there will always be people who figure out how to manipulate any system. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Well, uh, I tell you what. Let's. Uh, we've got a couple of things that we want to cover today for sure. So let's get into those, and if we have time. Later we'll come back and we'll we'll touch on some of these other. I've got some news articles and some interesting tidbits here, but we can we can push those to the end. Let's talk right now about texture memory management. Oh, I know Ed, you, you had a. Long, I closed every window on my screen. Give me two oh, excellent. seconds. Oh, excellent. Reopen. I will. Uh, I will tap dance while you reopen. Helping me out. Uh, so so basically, Ed's come up with this way of being able to um, cut down on the amount of texture memory that's required. For having a, a large number of objects in your uh, being displayed at any given time, and which is probably not a great way to 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 uh, summarize it, but but he, he's created a whole demo for it, and it, it, the you know, the visuals will explain everything that you need to know. Yep. All right, so I can get this done pretty quickly. Okay. Um, basically, what it is, it's a. Uh, let's say you're creating an application, and you know that you're going to have many tens to hundreds to maybe thousands of unique images that you need to display and you don't have a lot of control over when they are displayed so you're faced with a dilemma basically do I keep the object in memory rendered and ready to go or do I remove it when it's not on the screen how do I deal with the ambiguity of needing this image promptly at some random moment um, and yet also deal with the amount of memory that gets used. So uh, for a typical application, let's say you're... Uh, how do I measure this? Let me just give you the example. So what I've done is I've created an example that takes three textures, and for this example it duplicates these textures in the temporary folder. So um, 
if you don't understand this, one of the things that you need to understand about how textures work is for every texture that you load into memory, if you load a texture, let's say abc.png, and then you use it over again to make another object, and you use it to make another object, what you're really doing is reusing the same texture memory over and over. And there's a little bit of overhead of texture memory and a little bit of overhead of main memory to track that object. But you're getting a free reuse of most of that texture information as it's stored on your video device, be it like on your PC, or stored in memory on your mobile. So to create this example, I took three unique textures and duplicated them over and over, giving them each a unique name and storing them in the temporary folder. And then I could use each of these generated, in a sense, textures to create one screen object to demonstrate the drawback of having hundreds to thousands of objects. So I'll go ahead and share my screen here. So it builds up over, over as we have unique objects, it builds up uh, memory, is that what we're saying? Yeah, so when you add more and more, more objects to your application or game, you're going to have to pay the penalty of the cost of storing the um, texture in memory and some data about the position of the object and other visual attributes. But the biggest penalty you're paying is the texture memory. So, uh, for example, if I run this example and I tell it to run example one, I'll go back and explain this in a moment, I tell it to display simply 10 textures, but that's going to cost me. Can you read that okay? Yep, looks, look, comes through good. So the main memory cost for simply 10 textures, and I'll show you the textures in a moment, is going to be um, 7 tenths of a megabyte, so not very much main memory, but 34 megabytes of texture memory to store these 10 unique textures. Now, I know that they don't look unique, but each of these is coming from a separate file. It's, it's critical that you understand that. So as far as the um, application is concerned, each one of these is a different texture. So it has to make space for that texture, has to store it, and then use it. So just for 10, we're hitting 34. And then if we crank this up to 100, as you would expect, after it takes a moment to redraw, we're well over 300 megabytes of texture memory. Wow. And the problem just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So let me pause this for a moment and show you the actual source images. That's not the right folder. So the actual source images are an image that I took off of some random posting from one of your um, Corona Geek posts, which is a JPEG on disk. It's uh, okay. Google Hangout is not helping me. Stop it. Uh, 139k. Yeah, it is 139k. Yeah, on my screen, I've got this big block that says you can stop sharing at any moment. It's covering the, the information I'm trying to talk about. <laughs> Uh, it's 100 and, uh, but it's 1024 by 1024, which is going to come out to, um, what is that? In texture memory, I think that's going to come out to 8 meg, something like that. Anyways, it, it's irrelevant. The point is, it's a significant amount of texture memory. And then this is also a large image, 1024 it's, by 768. It's 3 megs. Sir? 3 megs of memory. 3 megs? Only 3 meg in memory? Yeah, it's uh, one million of pixels well, yeah, okay, and, that makes uh, and three bytes per pixel. Three bytes per pixel. Okay, there we go. Because there's well, what about if you have an alpha channel? Then it's four bytes. All right. Right. So I think we have to include the alpha channel because you don't know for sure in Corona if you're going to have an alpha channel or not. I don't know if it encodes if it's smart enough to encode three or four channels based on what it sees in the texture. So, but worst case, it's three to four megabytes for this texture right here. If we do that 10 times, that's 40 megabytes. The reason ours were smaller is because I'm using two smaller textures of a lower dimension, 1024 by 768. So slightly less storage required. So, and then uh, in this example, as I said, when you run it, I should probably explain this first. When people run this example, and we'll provide a link to this code later, they should open up main.lua, and make sure that lines 54 through 56 are commented out. And this is, this is how it will come. So if you run it first this way, 
run first with the number of textures set to 1,000 and not running any of the examples. And what this will do is it will generate those 1,000 textures in the temporary folder. And I would suggest running this on your computer. You can run it on your device, but you're probably going to want to remove the entire application later so you can get rid of all this stored temporary data easily. It'll, it'll eventually erase it, but uh, by removing it directly, you'll clean this up immediately. And Ed, Ed, if you would, just show them how to get to the temp temporary directory. I can do that. So to get to the temporary folder on Windows, and it's similar on uh, OS X, is you go to the File um, menu. And then in our case, it says Show Project Sandbox. You may have to dig through some further submenus on OS X, but eventually you're going to find a reference to Sandbox. And you'll do that. And under here, you're going to find two folders. One of them is the Documents folder. The other one is called temp, and that's the temporary resources directory. That's where I'm creating the textures. And if we look at these, nearly the same texture over and over and over with some randomly generated texture name. So um, the solution to this is, is not to display, I'll give it away, is not to display every texture if it's not on the screen. The question is, is how do you detect that? How do you decide when to show and when not to show a texture? So, when so I'm saying don't show. Go ahead. So sorry. So in example one, you you you're showing what ten or hundred uh, textures there. Yes. So you're saying that even when those are those items aren't on the screen, they're still held in memory. Is that what you're saying? That you're is still? correct. Okay. Because the because Corona does not know whether that. Needs to, can it doesn't know how to remove that from memory and yet make sure that it's there just in time for you to display it. In theory, uh, the engineers at Corona could do something that would say, if it's not visible... They tried, it failed. It. Sir? They tried, it caused a lot of bugs. Yeah, it, it's, it's a costly and dangerous operation if you do just a general solution. So what I'm giving you here is a solution that is general but can be easily modified to your own purposes, to your own situation. So when I say that you're not going to display this, what I'm really doing is for textures, for images that are not on the screen in a visible space, I temporarily fill them with a, another texture, just a tiny one pixel texture, and then I can have hundreds and hundreds of objects, or thousands, and all of the ones that are off screen are all sharing a little itty bitty tiny texture which uses up almost no texture memory and no resources basically so since you're not displaying it there's no point in wasting the space and then what the algorithm does is it checks back from time to time and I'll explain that in a moment and it says is the image on screen is it about to be on screen is it near to being on screen and if so it refills it with the original texture so over time, all the textures, all the images that are on screen will always have the correct texture filling the rectangle or whatever it is that you've got displayed. And just to demonstrate the difference, so our, in our previous example, uh, we had 100 objects, which cost us 330 megabytes. But if we run example two, which uses one of two solutions, which I provided, and we rerun this with 100 um, textures, it brings us down to about 20, 25 megabytes, which is a lot more reasonable. Nice. Unfortunately, I can see that um, as this is playing, it's sort of the uh, jumpy. Yeah, but that's just the Hangout. That's, that's yeah. the Hangout doing that. Prime rate of the Hangout. So, it's, yeah, I've seen this uh, demo up front, uh, you know, live, and it it's just as smooth on example one, uh, example two as, as it is on example one. So. So, uh, so what are we what are we doing here? Basically, what I've got, I'll just take you to the code. Is I've got a piece of code that's about sixty lines long, and what it is, it's a single function call where you pass in the object, which is the object you created, and then you pass in a texture that you want to fill with when it's on the screen, a texture that you'd like to fill with when it's not on the screen a buffer, which is a number of pixels that you should consider to be on screen or off screen. So if it's within, let's say you set the buffer to 100, if it's within 100 pixels of the edge of the screen or further, that is it's left or right or above 
by 100 pixels, it should be considered to be on screen, at which point it would be filled with this texture here, fill 1. In all other cases, it will fill it with texture fill 2. And then the base directories are just uh, base directory 1 and 2 go with the textures in case uh, you store your um, textures in a temporary directory or in the resource directory, which most people do. The resource directory being the directory where all your code is. Or the documents directory, which is the other one I showed you just a moment ago. These are all places where your textures might live during the lifetime of an application. And I'm not going to go into all the details of how this code works. It's pretty easy to, um, to parse over. But there are two basic versions of this. There's what I call the frame filler and another one which I call delay filler. Frame filler, uh, every enter frame event for every object that's using this will run this little algorithm. The algorithm will go through and it will measure the location of the object, determine if it's on screen or off screen, and then once it knows whether it's on screen or off screen, it will check to see if it's currently filled or not filled, and it will fill or unfill it appropriately. It'll put the correct texture in or the placeholder texture. So the drawback of this is, for every object you have, this is a new piece of code executing every frame. So this is the one that gives you the most precise filling as far as fast movement. So you set up an appropriately sized buffer that says, uh, say, 100 or 200 or 500 pixels from the edge of the screen. And as long as the object doesn't move faster than 500 pixels per second, it's never going to come on screen and not be filled. So this is a very um, precise way of filling your textures. And of course, my phone rings right now. <laughs> and the, the other one, okay, though, is a, a time-based. So how does that affect So the time-based one is it's exactly the same loop except it's based on perform with delay. So you can set some random amount of time. If you know that your game doesn't have fast motion, um, or you can, you can deal with something popping onto screen, say, not being displayed promptly, depending on how you uh, adjust this algorithm, you can use perform with delay, which says, for every object that I have, it waits some number of milliseconds, and then it checks again. So uh, just to compare these two, using the inner frame, if you're doing it 33 frames, uh, 30 frames per second, that's every 33 milliseconds, every object will run this algorithm. So that can quickly become a lot of computation. So if you're in a situation where you can't afford that, you might want to use the delayed filler. And I'll just show you these in use. Uh, one thing that people, when they look at this code, look at example one first and just see how it's set up. And really, all you want to look at is part two here, which is where it creates this group of images. Part three is the memory HUD. And part four is the code that's just moving this image up and down to keep it moving on and off screen, or moving these images on and off screen. So the part that does the drawing is this loop here under two, which is about 30 lines of code. Then if you look at example two, example two is exactly the same, except at the point in the code, let me make it bigger so you can see it, the point in example one where it just simply filled it in with the current image that we're selecting, it calls either frame filler or delayed filler, which then starts executing and making the appropriate decision as far as whether to fill with a temporary image or the actual image. So you don't have to modify your existing code almost at all to make this work. Nice. Ed, I have a question. Yes, if please. If you're using an uh, object, not a rectangle, but an usual image, and um, you can change the field with um, image.field, but if you uh, assign nil to the field, does it return to original image or not? Hmm. I don't know. It may. may, may not. I, I would assume that it will not return to the original image because it could have cleared it at that point. So unless a Corona is smart enough to know that it should reload that into memory, then I'm going to say no. But that's an interesting experience, uh, experiment, is to simply pass in, well, you have to change the code to set it to nil on the second fill. So the first fill, it would use the appropriate texture, and after that, it would always just set it to nil 
on the assumption that Corona will understand and set it back to the original texture. But I'm going to say no, because once you've replaced it with another texture, it doesn't know. Corona shouldn't be able to figure out what the appropriate texture is backwards from that. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You have a rectangle, you set it with texture A, fill. Then you set it to texture B, fill. Then you set it to nil. What would be the appropriate response at that point? Vicious rise some, sometime. Yeah, well, we could test it simply now. Oh, uh, I wanted to show this. I forgot. You were making announcements, and I forgot to make an announcement. Uh, my entire catalog has gone on sale. Actually, I've decided to change the pricing of all the, all the uh, templates and tools on my site to a very low, simple pricing plan of what I call one, two, three. It's one dollar, two dollar, or three dollars, which is a very deep discount for some of these tools. And one of these tools is the um, what I call the super meter. So included in this example is a very basic meter showing memory and texture. But we could also run this with the super meter, which would give us a much better visual impression of what's going on here. And this tool is three dollars, and there are other tools and templates on my site. So if you're watching and you want to support me and see more cool examples, please go to my site. And that's roaminggamer.com? Roaminggamer.com, yes. I will yeah. provide a link for the show. Oh, yeah, definitely. We'll definitely put a link in the show notes. I just want to point out that you've, you've included the, the meter in this app, but you could add that to any of your apps. Right, so. yes, that's absolutely. This is a, for those who don't know what this is, it's basically a debug tool of sorts that allows you to examine the current frame rate and the historical frame rate the main memory usage, the video memory usage, the combined usage, which is uh, unified memory usage. We put both of these together and examine them side by side. And um, myriad other tools, which give you a view of pretty much everything that's going on in your app as far as info, uh, settings, physics settings. Uh, it's got a debug tool for taking snapshots, so people who are uh, you're working with a client, they're seeing a bug, and they'd really, really like to show you. You could say, well, just send me a picture of that, and then they can snap that picture, just as I did there, and it snaps a picture of the problem, and then they click email and send you an email. Very so nice. It's a very easy tool to use, and uh, it gives you a little bit of a little bit of assistance for those hard debug um, scenarios. Very nice. Yeah, I, I know that that's a you know as a, as a techie we know how to do that, take a screenshot or whatever. But I mean, it's not always and it's not always easy on every device, and it's not always intuitive. So, and then getting it to the developers not always, you know, if you can make it if you make things painless, it's always better. Yeah, I mean, I ran into that, which is why I put it in the tool. Which is I had a I had a client who was saying I keep seeing this. And I'm like, okay, well, can you give me a video or something? And and then I finally just included the tool, and I said, when you see it, press this button. And then they did, and I'm like, aha, because they couldn't really describe what the problem was. And I'm like, ah, I understand now what you're trying to tell me. I didn't do the uh, 1,000 textures. I won't even, I don't suggest you run this using example one with 1,000 textures. It's just going to be um, out of control. You may crash your machine. I don't know what you'll do. But as you would assume, we run this with 1,000 textures, we get exactly the same memory usage, or just about. The only increase we see here is that now we're using a little bit more main memory, which is that part where it's tracking individual object metrics, like their position uh, and other little details about them. So you just changed it to 1,000, then that's what you did? Yeah, I increased it tenfold, and my texture Perfect. memory didn't change almost at all. Gotcha. Went up by about two two megabytes. I think that's fantastic. I, I, so it's so it's really taking the image that goes off the screen and replacing it with with the pixel. Yeah, yeah. If there was a good way to show you. Yeah, sure. Well, I can actually actually I can show you. So really, that item still is still kind of in the list. It's just not taking up texture memory. Right. So I'm going to change the example a little bit here, and um, if you pass you can, in, you can Google, change. Sir? You can change the current stage scale to uh, 0 0.1, for example. Yeah. That will or, show the... What I'm doing to demonstrate this is changing the buffer to 0. And a 0 buffer means that it will redraw or fill at the edge of the screen. I can't seem to press return here. But when I rerun this, you should see these start popping. See? They're popping. 
I'm mm -hmm. using a white texture, one pixel in size, which just expands the fill. So as soon as these things get to within, the center gets to within one pixel of the edge of the screen, because these are all measured from the center of the, the um, rendering object, it switches over to the other fill. And then if it was coming down, we'd see it doing the same thing. It's going to be a while before it starts coming back down. Yeah, but, yeah, a thousand uh, inches, now, yeah. But that's the point. The point is, is that uh, there you can see that it's actually working and doing the fill. Of course, we don't want that. Uh, the easiest thing for people to do if they're using this is just set that argument to nil. And what it will do is it will calculate the size of your object, and it will do a just-in-time load, which basically says load it as soon as the edge is near this, the edge of the screen or unload it once the edge goes off the screen. So you don't have to do it yourself. You don't have to figure out the buffer. And then if you find the buffer isn't big enough, you can always make it larger. I could make this a 500, and I would get the same, pretty much the same results. I have to add that uh, this technique is called uh, occlusion calling. You haven't said it. And uh, I want to share my experience with uh, widget stable view. OK, uh, yeah. Table view has also a uh, occlusion calling algorithm, but on the, they display a rows that only on the screen. If zero, it goes off screen, it gets unloaded, and uh, it's loaded back again when you scroll it on the screen. And if you have some images in the draw, uh, and you scroll the uh, table view, it gets uh, sluggish, like uh, really not comfortable. You can see it's uh, legs a little, and uh, it's not beautiful. So Absolutely. my work was to remake the entire table view, and I implemented a different um, technique. So I've made all the rows uh, in memory, but all the images that were in rows, I was um, unloading them. Uh, the problem with the original table, you had no buffer. I added uh, a, um, some nice uh, buffer, like uh, 201 um, sizes of the screen. And uh, to avoid the lag when you uh, corona load images uh, into the applications, like it takes several milliseconds for all the files to be read, uh, I simply don't uh, read the images or what, uh, until user stops scrolling. So when you scroll, uh, if you uh, load the image while you're scrolling, see, a user sees the leg, some little leg. It, it's right, annoying. Right. Uh, but when you uh, when you scroll and you see uh, that images image has to be loaded back again, uh, you just uh, show him some default image like. Uh, how it's called? Like a placeholder? Placeholder, yeah. right. And when he stops scrolling, you take it and you load it back again. Mm -hmm. I have to admit something. Function. What? I, I wanted to show this because I thought it would be interesting for the, not the readers, the listeners, the watchers. But I also wanted to show this because I used this technique a little bit more advanced than what I'm showing here recently. But I was still not 100% happy with the performance. There were some things that made me unhappy, which is what you just pointed out, which is the, let's say you're using this technique and you're doing it a lot, you still got to pay that penalty for the file open read. And if that happens in the middle of some time sensitive, like a scroll or a screen transition, you're going to see a hiccup. Right. And so I hadn't yet solved that. I had some ideas. And what I was really hoping was that I would show this and Sergey would sit there. <laughs> and then he would say, yes, but. <laughs> <laughs> so there, everybody's satisfied now. I got, the, uh, I got to show my demo and I got my yes, but from Sergey. You got your, so got your me, answer to what you're looking for? Elaborate here. So, Sergey, what you said was is basically. When you know that you've got a time-sensitive situation, something going on, you defer the actual reload. Actually, I make a listener on user scrolling. Mm -hmm. And if the table view is not scrolled, or uh, if it's being scrolled, I set up a listener to when the mm -hmm. event is ended, and then I just load it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, see, because that's exactly the situation. I had a situation where people were swiping and swiping and swiping and swiping, causing this sort of scenario that you're seeing with the motion. 
And every once mm -hmm. in a while there'd be a hiccup. And I knew that it was this unloading impacting the swipe motion. But I did not write the code because it's more complicated to do the deferral. You know, you, you, every, every change you make to your code, you open yourself up to a new book. So I try not to do that if I don't need to. Right. Every action you defer could cause a problem later. So, yeah. all right, well, good. I'm going to have to experiment with that later because I'm still trying to make that a little smoother. So, you know, you said you're going to make this code available for people to download and play with themselves, right? That's correct. Uh, once I remember to extract uh, the RG meter uh, code, I will go ahead and commit it, and I will give a link uh, bef before we even finish up here. I'll be doing that. Okay, well, excellent. Thanks for, uh, for demoing that and for working out the details on it. And if you come up with uh, a hybrid of what you and Sergey are talking about, are you, you going to share that out with us or, or what? Uh, you know, I kind of hesitate to not because it's just the example I've given is it's grokkable. It's small mm -hmm. enough that people can look at it, and I don't. Once I start modifying it more than this, it becomes almost situation specific. Gotcha. At this point, it's very general, but there's a lot of things you could do. For example, one thing you could do, you could look at the parent of the image all the images, and if the parent is not visible, or the parent's parent is not visible, either the alpha is set to zero, or the visibility flag is set to zero, treat that also as an off-screen. I mean, so there's a lot of ways you could make this more efficient, or more inclusive. Well, I, I, I started I, to do that when I wrote this example. I'm like, oh, this is going to make it too complicated for people to understand what's going on. Well, here's what I think should happen. I think I think you know you you come up with this and you're going to share it out with everybody and and it's a good starting point. And I and then I think that the um, these situation specific things people should come back to you and say, hey Ed, I'd like to uh, modify this and uh, I'd like to pay you to help me to do that. Yeah. Yeah. So th I think that's a fair yeah. way to way to handle those types of things. So do I. You know, I think <laughs> I've been talking. I, I do that. I talk so long. Sergey's got something for us, yeah. Well, Sergey's got, right. uh, yeah, he's got a configuration file, a super duper configuration file he wants to share with us. So, Sergey, take it away. Yeah, recently I was working on a project and I came out, oh, come out with, oh, come up, come up, not came out, uh, come up with an awesome config file that handles really every device really well. Let me show this. Yeah, and we we have expanded our list, right? I mean, now now we have iOS, we have six, uh, iPhone six and six plus, and uh, you know, I'm sure there are, I mean, Note four is probably in there someplace. Uh, right. Yeah. So uh, I want to explain the problem first. So uh, usually people uh, say in Config Lua something like that: application content width uh, 320, 480. That's most common thing, and uh, your screen uh, share. Do you see my screen? Yeah, well, I see. I see me. I see uh, our hangout on the screen. How do? I, oh, I. It may, may, may need to, I did the wrong. A different window. Yeah. Yeah. It's always a, it's always kind of a gamble on Google Hangouts as to which one you. you no, know, it's like a, it's I don't blame Google. It's my fault. Oh, okay. Don't blame Google. Okay. I blame, I blame Sergey. <laughs> Sergey solar flares, fun. man. It's solar flares. <laughs> okay, so application content, uh, free twenty four eighty usual stuff. It uh, displays perfectly on uh, usual iPhones like iPhone four, four S, and something like that. You have content uh, this and uh, the scale suffix is too, and you have pixel perfect. Uh, image on your device. Pixel perfect means all your images are not blurry; uh, they are uh, all perfectly uh, displayed. But when you uh, run such application on iPad, uh, I hate this new uh, menu for switching screen sizes. Uh, was the wrong? I did the wrong. We can see it. Did, 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 yeah, the wrong one. Oh, the wrong uh, example. The wrong code example. Uh, there we go. There we go. Yes, and when you run it on iPad, why it's 
Fertino one. I right. want the, the extra width problem. Yes, extra width problem. So uh, you have extra content left, extra content right, and uh, and the image are not pixel perfect because the scale is two point one three 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 three. And if you display it on iPhone five, you have a pixel perfect uh, image, but uh, as well this uh, unused space, which is kind of uh, hard to incorporate in your application. And what happens with uh, latest iPhone? So this is uh, iPhone 6, which is not plus. You get as well <clears throat> not pixel perfect image. It's blurry. And uh, you have bars at the top at the bottom. And now we enable my config Lua that I made. Refresh uh, the simulator. And it makes the image pixel perfect. Scale is equal to uh, 2. And uh, you have no bars at the top and the bottom. Nice. And this comes for every device that you can think of. You can uh, choose it. You can view it on any device in the simulator, and it always uh, show you uh, your content full screen, and uh, it will make uh, image pixel perfect uh, as long as it uh, suits enough for application. Oh, iPhone, uh, iPhone 6, iPhone 6 Plus. So it's always uh, iPhone 6 Plus is an um, interesting situation because uh, it's not nearly enough for uh, exactly for scale factor, and I made it free. So uh, if you supply graphics for uh, extra, especially for these situations, which would be uh, 3x, that would be pixel perfect. But without it, it's, it takes images from uh, Retina uh, version and scales them down. So it's not pixel perfect, but it's still pretty good to think about. So uh, what I was doing uh, to find out this uh, is uh, first I have made a simple test uh, configuration file. That I've made a list of all screen sizes that are available currently. Uh, the, this, is most, this is the most common one. So first we, got, we have all iOS devices. Then we have some medium sized, small sized Androids, so normal sized and Androids, and then comes high resolution. Uh, this is the algorithm, and I'm when I run the script in simple Lua interpreter, I can see its output which gives me the calculations that I would get on, on each device. So uh, I can look at this uh, table and see for which device what scale factor would be and what content size it would be. So uh, I can add more resolutions to the uh, table and I would and I could, uh, will be able to test against new devices if there will be some new devices with new resolutions. So, so these these uh, scale uh, aspect ratios here and the scale factor and all that, uh, that's output here. Are you saying that you would then take that and put it into your configuration file? It's all calculations. Uh, this file, it's called uh, test scaling Lua. I've developed to adjust to come up with this uh, algorithm. So, uh, and uh, I would run the script, and I would check all the uh, output that it gives me. Uh, if it's choosing the correct uh, content uh, resolution and correct scale factor, and I, if it's uh, if it doesn't give me a correct one, I would uh, uh, change the algorithm. And this was the final version. 
So how does it work? Oh, this is a config loss. This is not testing the test one. Uh, first, I set, uh, set up a table of modes. Modes it is scaling factors to try. So one is original, like the first iPhone. One and a half. This is all weird Android devices with resolutions like uh, 400 by 800 and around this. It's uh, they're not enough for scaling too and uh, bigger than the original scaling. Uh, these devices are not pixel perfect, so it's a tr uh, trade-off, uh, but I use uh, for them normal letterboxing, so it's fine. And so other factors are all pixel perfect, so it's two, three, especially for iPhone 6 Plus, and four, six, eight. Uh, this all look great, so you don't have 2.1, you don't have uh, 3.1, Eight or something like that. So it's every, it's all rounded up. It's all nice on the screen. Next is come configurations for the algorithm. Uh, minimal width and minimal height. Is this are numbers of the content that you can uh, display? So if your application fits in uh, three pixels uh, wide and uh, four pixel uh, four hundred and sixty wide uh, in height, uh, you or uh, input these values. Uh, if your content doesn't fit in uh, 300 pixels, you make it uh, 320, and uh, algorithm will uh, choose correct orientation anyway. Uh, this makes difference for Kindle Fire first. Uh, first generation. Let me show it. It has... Um, 600 widths and uh, 1024. So it's 600 but by 1024. And um, if you use it with uh, 300, uh, it displays fine. It's scale factor 2, it's pixel perfect. But if you say uh, 320 and you restart, it's not pixel perfect because it's not enough content. So I recommend to fit your content in 300 pixels because of this device. And if you manage to actually, uh, let's open up uh, iPhone 6 Plus. So this is 6 Plus. Uh, the scale factor is free. If you make this value to 170, Seven, 270, yes. Uh, it would be uh, scale 4. So if you can fit this, uh, it will be uh, pixel perfect, but uh, all the elements will be really big. So I recommend using this value anyway for, for 6 plus. Okay, let's open something different iPhone 5. So yeah, then uh, this loop, it tries each mode uh, that has a scale factor, and it divides uh, the effective, the original uh, resolution of the device, which is pixel width and pixel height of the device, and uh, divides it by the mode. It's 1, 1 and a half, 2, 3, 4, 6, 8. And then it checks uh, if um, the content weight and content height would be lower than minimal, it would fail. And the previous uh, previous mode would be chosen. So if it doesn't fail, the, uh, the mode is being recorded in these variables, and it's used after that. Uh, this piece of code then adjusts for uh, low resolution devices, and if detect it detects if mod one and a half was chosen, you don't really use one and a half, but use uh, a more standard resolution, uh, which is a comfortable one, 320 by 480, and calculate letterbox scaling for it. So it uh, so it uses normal width and normal height, uh, divides it by actual width and actual height of the device, and it chooses the 
uh, scale factor which is needed to apply so everything fits on screen. Uh, uh, this is good for Android devices like, for example, 480 by 800. So, uh, no, it's actually quite fine with 1.5. Let's open up another one. For example, this one, ridiculous one. It's uh, 400 by 80, 55, 54. So it's more than, aspect ratio is more than two. Well, it's it's very tall device. I don't remember what model it is, but it's very rare but and uh, very weird. So uh, right now, it's getting factor uh, 1.2. And it fits nicely with the content width being uh, 320. Uh, if we disable this block, it will choose 1.5. And the image will be a uh, scale factor 1. It will be a uh, pixel perfect. Oh, it's actually, I have a bag. It should be it should be saying yes. That's fine. And uh, But the picture is very small because you can see uh, the rectangles are very small and on such small screens all your content will be really small. It's not good. So uh, this adjustment is really nice for such lower resolution devices. Um, yeah, I like that it's smart enough to figure that out on the fly. That's definitely interesting. And what you have to account for is that every time you do this, uh, you will have different content size. So you should be accounting for, uh, you can depend on fixed numbers. You should rely on corners. So on my demo uh, file, I define uh, width and height, which is a uh, content width and content height of the uh, current setup. I define center of the screen and uh, uh, a rectangle at the top left corner would be with, uh, with coordinates 0, 0. And if you remember, if you don't, if you use normal scaling uh, like letterbox, uh, if you place 0, 0 and open up on iPhone 5, uh, your top left elements would be lower than you expect. They, won't, they, won't, uh, they would be not in the top left corner, they would be lower. Like uh, this tall, and if we disable the uh, icon to glue and use the normal one, they would be lower. So that's the problem. Uh, with my config Lua, uh, your elements zero zero is always at the top left, and width height is always at the bottom right. So it's much easier to uh, code your applications and games. You don't have to worry about this extra uh, width and size that can be to the left or to the right. So it's much more comfortable to uh, to work with. So uh, this code is available on my GitHub. It's GitHub, large, awesome config Lua. You can go and download it. Uh, also, don't forget to read my blog, spiralcodestudio.com, and subscribe to my Twitter, where I post uh, links to my recent uh, blog entries. Very good. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'll, I'll be interested to go out and play with that. Uh, like to, I think. You know, uh, Ed and I have had this conversation before about you know scaling assets for different sizes. Uh, you know, especially when going, like you said, going between say like the iPhone and the iPad. You know, and and what, how do you address that? And uh, so I, I like that this is actually calculating all that on the fly, figuring mm -hmm. figuring most of it out as it goes. One of the most annoying things that I find myself doing all the time is accounting for that unused width or the unused height. Because I almost always use Letterbox, and then when you do that, and you've designed for the iPhone 5, and you run it on an iPad, you've got to deal with that extra width, and it's just a pain. Yeah, usually I have four variables that uh, left, 
right, top, bottom coordinates, and I all my elements uh, have uh, relative. these variables relative to them. Yeah, yeah, it's it's okay, but it's a little bit annoying. So, we, but with this setup, I can read of them and use only width and height. That would be enough. I don't know how many times I've made the mistake of not including one situation where I checked the right. Width. Right, and you're like, oh, everything aligns up except that one element didn't line up. Awesome. Yeah, and if you want it to be uh, exactly the same every time, then that can be kind of annoying. Yeah, so. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, it, it may it, it may still function exactly. You know, it may not impede the functioning of the app, but you know, you as a developer, are, you know, you know, you know, it's not there. Exactly. That's the part that's that's annoying. Takes a long time. Sergey, how long did it take you to write this up? Uh, oh, five hours. Of, say again? Five hours. Five hours. So you just, just decided, you said, I've had enough of this. Right. So it starts out, yeah, it starts out as your, your own use, and then you, uh, you're you trying to solve a problem that you came across, and, and now you're sharing it out with everybody else, which is awesome. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Well, I think I we're all at it. For you to write, if you want. Go ahead. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sergey's like, I don't need more work. I know. I have something else to play with. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. So uh, I think we're out of time for today. So what we'll do is we'll just push our animated uh, score counter thing to next week. We'll also talk about uh, reskinning games. We've got some uh, some stuff to talk about there. And uh, we'll also go, if you guys haven't had a chance to go check out the link on the Corona Labs blog for the iPhone 6 uh, tutorial that was out there, go check that out. Uh, we, if we have time, we'll, we'll touch on it next week. But uh, it's something you might want to check out before then. And uh, we've got a few other things we'll we'll we'll, we'll talk about next week. So, uh, so the, uh, so thanks for joining us. And until next week, happy coding. Cheers. Yeah. Have a good